you're looking at one of the most important ingredients of 20th century life. Nylon. But a word of advice. If nylon makes you think of bristles on a toothbrush, think again. Because as a branch of the plastics industry, nylon brushes up against much more than teeth. In fact, not only does it cover almost every aspect of our daily lives, in many cases it covers the very ground we walk on. But whereas we all know something about metal, and a great deal about wood, many of us aren't quite so sure about nylon. What is amazing is that the history of nylon is so short. So short, in fact, that an old age pensioner would have been born into a world where nylon wasn't even in the dictionary, let alone the home. To trace its development, we have to go back to 1920s America. More specifically, to a man who may have been blessed with an ingenuity far ahead of his time, but was not so fortunate in the namestakes. Wallace Hume Carruthers. Perhaps young Wall felt he had a goal in life, something that went beyond having the longest name tag in the school. Whatever it was that spurred him on, in 1928, while working as a chemist for the American company DuPont, he embarked on an ambitious project to create a polymer. If nylon is a polymer, which of course it is, what are polymers? Well, they're made up of single molecules, all binding together to form an almost unbreakable chain, or polymer. The process which fuses them together is called polymerization. And it was the absence of this act of fusion that was creating the problem. But not for Carruthers, because within 10 years he'd succeeded where others had failed. In 1938, the first commercially produced nylon became available. The effect on the world and Carruthers was nothing less than dramatic. That's because the invention of nylon didn't just start the synthetic fibre industry, it changed the world. Unfortunately, it didn't change Wall, at least not for the better. A long-time sufferer from depression, he committed suicide at the age of 41. As for the name nylon, well, that remains something of a mystery. Rumour has it that it was an amalgamation of New York and London. Who knows? Of course, since its beginnings, nylon has passed through a number of refinements. Today, there are some dozen or so useful types on the market, each blessed with its own unique set of characteristics. Type 6 is cast nylon, and this is the form we're concerned with here. So why bother to cast nylon as opposed to the more orthodox processing methods, such as injection moulding or extrusion? The answer lies in cast nylon's ability to form, unlike other types, extremely long chains. Result? A far higher molecular weight, affording greater toughness and increased wear resistance. Cast nylon grade 6, to give it its full title, has proved highly successful. But to get a better idea of its superior quality, try a straight comparison. Take a bearing made from a non-ferrous metal like phosphor bronze or brass. The same bearing made from cast nylon will not only be approximately one-eighth the weight, it'll outlast it by as much as five times. The implications for industry are clear. Extended life of components, less maintenance downtime. And in the all-important industrial equation, that means two things. Higher productivity and greatly reduced costs.